Welcome to the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast. Today's special guest is an award-winning nonprofit leader, a TEDx speaker, author, and co-host of Brilliantly Resilient Daily Online Show. And I am thrilled that she is on today. Welcome, <laughs> Kristen Smedley. 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 You had it right Sorry. the first time. There you go. Don't oh, I did. Yourself. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Good. Um, all right. So I know we met at the Brilliant brilliantly resilient live show when we were allowed to socialize with people before the quarantine hit (laughs) and I had such a great time and I was really moved by your story and I was wondering if you could share a little bit how your life went from picture perfect to full-on crash yeah so it's a beautiful story (laughs) (laughs) hold on to your hat so I was so here's the thing I'll back way up and say that I was one of those freakish kids that for two reasons first of all I knew what I wanted to do with my life since I was about five or six years old. I knew I wanted to be a teacher and I was like so crazy about it that I have a zillion brothers and I would, God love them. I would sit them all in little chairs in my dad's workshop at the back of our basement because we had a chalkboard on the back of the door and I would teach them whatever I felt like teaching them and write on the board and hand things out. And they sat there and they were like, (laughs) I guess they were scared of me, but anyway, so I just, I think the part of the reason is it's just in my DNA, but also I did very well at school. School was a place for me that was, it was fun. And I, I was a high achiever and I, I'm a people pleaser by nature. So I, and I went all through Catholic school. So there were rules and things were lined up in order. And that was how I just, that was how I rolled. So I had all this success and then, and I was a rule follower and I did everything I was supposed to. I'm the only girl with a million brothers. So I had a lot on me. There was a lot of expectations of me. I played every sport and had a lot of success with that. So I I always say I followed every rule. And then I went to college um, here in the Philly area where you go, well, a million years ago, if you were gonna be a teacher, you went to Westchester University. So I went Mm. there. You know, I did everything right. And then I finally, um, all of, you know, I'm also one of those list makers. I don't know if it's because I'm a Virgo or what, but I am a list, check it off. You know, when's your birthday? I'm a Virgo too. I'm the 19th. 29th. Oh yeah. Same day as Michael Jackson. That's the only. (laughs) (laughs) How about them apples? The only celebrity uh, (laughs) birthday that I know of. (laughs) So at any rate, I was like checking off boxes. I love being able to check off my list. And then at the point when I was like, I mean, I went to the school I was supposed to, graduated, landed the job, married the husband, had the beautiful house, had the perfect manicured lawn. I even had like SUVs came out and I had the brand new SUV. And I always say that at this point in my life, if I met me, from 20 years ago, I would so be, she'd be on my last nerve. Like it was way, (laughs) way too picture perfect, you know, whatever. And then I finally, my biggest dream of all time came true and I became a mom. And it was what, it was one of those other things that I just knew I wanted to be a mom. I I have an incredible role model for a mom. It always makes me like tear up. She's just great. And not in like super mom with a cape. She just is great. Right. Yeah. So I always knew that I was going to be a mom. So I finally had all the boxes checked and then I became a mom. And I'm like, God, my life was Hollywood movie. Perfect. And then at four months old, the doctor says to me, your son is blind. And I was just like, I mean, I think about that moment now and the three years after. And for a while there, I didn't talk about it because everybody sees me as for the most part put together and I accomplish a lot now again. But that was, it was the worst time in my life. And I realized I had no control over that diagnosis. Mm -hmm. The doctor certainly didn't start out my journey well, because all he said to me was, I don't know what to tell you. Good luck. You know, and a, a few years later, I would figure this out. But at that moment, you know, so when you have, you know, those listeners that have had kids, as your belly's growing, your hopes start to grow, your dreams. And you start probably like me. I mean, I was, I had success in, in sports and I'm thinking like football, baseball, Mm -hmm. which sport is it going to be and blah, 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 and all that. And my dreams were just getting bigger, bigger, bigger. And then when they said, your son is blind, I'm like, all I could think about at that moment was, oh my God, no baseball, no prom, 
no wedding, right? Nothing. Cause I, and I, I know now that the problem was I had no point of reference. And if I've learned nothing in 48 and a half, almost 49 years, <laughs> I have learned at least for my mind and my heart, if I don't have information, that's where my fear lies. Mm. I'm so afraid. Yeah. Right. I mean, yeah. the things that you don't know about. And I think if you look at our world, that's really where a lot of the problems stem from. People don't know about other people. Right. I totally agree. Absolutely. You know, even yeah. like this, what we're in right now with this virus, we don't know anything about it. So of course the fear right. grows and grows and grows. So anyway, so mm -hmm. I didn't know anything about blindness. I had no point of reference. All I had was Stevie Wonder and I'm talented at a lot of things and music <laughs> is not one of them. So I was like, well, I'm not going to have a musician, which funny enough, Michael is a music. He's like a recording artist, but, oh, cool. um, but at that moment, I just had no point of reference, no role model, no story to point to nothing. So good old me checking off a box. I went home <laughs> and sat on my couch and cried like for a, a ridiculously long time. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that was, not, that's hard though for like, I, you know, when you were saying about the doctor just being like, well, good luck, you know, like I have nothing to help you with. And th he yeah. failed you in that point. You know, I mean, he, he could have offered you suggestions or at least some sort of comfort. Yep. A bone, nothing. whatever. And, yeah. and I will say, you know, the fact that that's still happening 20 years later, and we'll, we can talk about that later. Um, was why I do the work I do now. But 20 years ago, I mean, I do give that guy a lot of grace and myself for all the, the crush that I was. Yeah. Because nobody, there was no Facebook yet. There was mm. no social stuff. There wasn't even hardly the internet yet right. to be able to just go and find people that were living with blindness. But my thing was, I needed people that were thriving with blindness, not just surviving. I needed the thriving piece because I was a, th my mindset is thriving. My, my DNA is resilience. It's, it's not just sitting and surviving in groundhog day every day where you're just doing the same thing and you're, you know, check your pulse. You're still alive. That's not my right. thing. Yeah. I think that's why you and Mary Fran resonate with me really a lot. Like I like to surround myself with people that are trying to level up all the time, not just, mm -hmm. it's one thing to kind of quote unquote, have a, your own pity party or, you know, feel bad for yourself, but do that, then move on. You know, yeah. don't just get stuck there and just kind of be a victim to your circumstances. Yeah. So, yeah. And that was my problem. Nobody, nobody in all of my networks and circles, no one had any idea what to tell me other than this sucks. Right. So then it became, um, so that was three years that I would smile all day, cry mm -hmm. all night, scared to death. I tried to reach out a little bit, little baby steps into the blindness realm and find out what I needed to teach my son. But it was so overwhelming to me that then it would crush me back even lower in the pit. Like, can you really go any lower? Yep. Kristen can find, I can yeah. dig a pit like you can't <laughs> imagine. Yeah. So anyway, but then then I started to have this nagging thing about, I knew I was going to be a mom of not just one child. I knew like I could feel it, that I was supposed to be a mom again. But the risk with CRB1 LCA, which is the rare eye disease that Michael has, the, the um, risk of having a second child is, see, I never really paid attention to my science classes in high school. <laughs> so if there's any high school kids listening, the please pay attention. Gene. And I was even in like the high achieving tracks, but I kind of like charmed my way through a lot of those classes. Right. And I would go off telling some story about something else. You know, I don't even know how I did it. But I, so I heard the genetics counselor say to me, when I heard 25% chance, I was thinking one in four pregnancies. Like, okay, mm. I got it on the first shot. So all my other kids, you know, as long as we just have four, they right. all be fine. <laughs> And then they were like, no, 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 no. It's every pregnancy stands a 25% chance. Mm. So then of course the delirious optimist in me was like, Psh, I 25 is nothing. 75 <laughs> is huge. Right. So the weirdo in me spent a couple of years researching, talking to people that were only children. I talked to school psychologists, child psychologists, all kinds of people researching for like a year and a half about having an only child and what would that be like? Because hmm. I'm one of like, I mean, I have 10,000 cousins. There was always people <laughs> you were tripping over, you right. know? 
so anyway, the long story short, I ended up, we ended up, you know, having a second child and it was actually uh, the greatest thing ever was having more kids because the first reason that that was the greatest thing is when I was pregnant with my second son, right around Easter, seven months pregnant, seven ish. I, um, I had this like massive come to Jesus moment, like literally because I woke up in the morning and I thought, oh, 25% is a big chance. Like that's a big number. Mm. And, and the delirious optimist woke up out of denial and was having this massive panic attack, mm. like, shoot, that's a big percentage. So I, I always say it was my most lovely Christian moment. I don't know why I'm not a pastor of a church after the way that I turned into prayer that morning. Oh my God. It's like, I'm sure it's on the wall of heaven going, this was the worst conversation ever. Remember that day when Krista woke up and screamed at all of us? Oh my God. Now, do you feel like I grew up Catholic as well and I went to Catholic school um, and you don't have to get too much into philosophy, but I know for me um, growing up, anytime something went wrong, I was like, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? What did I do to cause this? Yep. And that was even my air quote prayer, right? They say any talking to God is prayer. No, he had his fingers in his ears and was like, oh my God, (laughs) if only they had noise canceling headphones at that point. Because my thing was, dude, this is mean. Right. You know, to do that to a kid that he has, Michael has almost zero vision you know this cutest happiest little kid on the planet and he can't see a thing it's mean and then my thing was what did i ever do to deserve this like what Mm. could i have done that was so horrible that i would deserve something like that and and i'm telling you at that moment when i was when i was at my worst as a human that i could ever be michael came bouncing in my room at three and a half And I always, I should have like a button of his face at that age because, you know, I was going to be a teacher. I knew thousands of kids and had never met somebody as happy as he was since the day he was born. He just, (laughs) to this day, it's almost to his deficit sometimes. He treats every person like they're his best friend. Like you walk away from him feeling like you are top of the list and there's no competition. He just is so, and that's what happened to me. I looked at him and I'm like, he came in and his famous line is, isn't this the best day ever? And I was in full, ugly cry, sobbing, snot, everything, you know, (laughs) hair. And I'm like, the best day ever, why? Like, what is the matter with you? He was like, mommy, the sun is up. I have all my toys and I'm so happy. Yeah. It's all I cared about. And then, and he went back to playing and I thought that was, that was the biggest, like, I always say that, you know, they say there's the God whispers, mm. not with Kristen. He takes a sledgehammer and bangs me <laughs> over the head 57 <laughs> times until I finally get it. And that was my sledgehammer. Like, oh my God, this kid, I had missed it for three and a half years. I missed that he was the happiest. He figured everything out. He did everything a preschooler does so much so that they called me into the preschool and said, we don't think he's as blind as you think he is. Huh? (laughs) Because they had all these strategies to figure out who people were and how to get from one spot to the next. And he relied on people and he, he doesn't manipulate. It's a, it's this, it's this resilient. Yes. And this charm and this, willingness to let people lead him and and lean on them. It's really cool. But anyway, that was my moment of, okay, I'm the one in the way. I'm Mm -hmm. the one that, that has a problem with blindness and he doesn't. So then I was like, okay, I have no idea where this is going, but I said, because I'm I'm the the ultimatum with God. (laughs) And I go, all right, look. I've been there. (laughs) I'm like, well, this is on you now. So we've known each other 30 some years now, and you know that I can't handle this. So if you're going to give me a second one affected, then you bring me every person and tool that they need and I'll hand it Mm. over to them. I will be your go between, but I I got nothing here. I can't learn. (laughs) I can't figure it out. You send me and I will hand them over. And I swear to God to this day, to this day, all of that has happened. I mean, the people that have come into our lives and the accomplishments my boys have had is nothing short of a miracle that started on that day and never stopped. It's amazing. 
It is amazing. It's like um, I had a woman on um, my podcast a while ago, and one of her favorite quotes was, um, "Leap and a net will appear." Oh wow! Yeah, I and never I heard was. That. Oh, I mean, just and hearing you know your story told in a different way too, because like I remember at the live event, you that was my favorite part of your story. I have two favorite parts of your story. One was when you were saying you were sitting on the edge of your bed crying, and your son came in, and I just envisioning this little toddler kid like just being like all happy and high vibe and real high energy, and you know that was that was like it, it, in my opinion that was your blessing, you know, even though you were going through. Uh -huh. rock bottom. I mean, that was God's way of saying, Hey, look, <laughs> look what yeah. you got. Um, I've tapped into that with everything that happens now. I mean, it took me a good 10, 11 years to realize that that was the moment that changed everything. And it's that change mm -hmm. in perception that I talk about now, because if you can change the way you look at something, even in my divorce, I used it all over again because I'm like, wait a minute, how can I look at this? You know, and I looked at it as an opportunity to do all the things I was held back from, from being in a horrible marriage. Mm -hmm. that, why would I keep that going for the rest of it? Because I wanted a 50th wedding anniversary. That's stupid. But I think a lot yeah. of us get in that, you know, and I, my mom had said to me one time, do everything you can until you can't do anything anymore. And then you give it up, you know, and Mary Fran always says, give it up to God. You don't just give up. You do uh, everything you can, yeah. which I did. And then when it was finally, this isn't working, then I was like, all right, this is a chance to have a new chapter. I say that with a smile now, but if those of you that are out there in that pit, that yeah. was like a, a, at least two years of a lot of resources and tools that I used to get to that point of, I can smile about it now. Yeah. And I mean, look, dating in your late forties, stop the madness. Stop the only madness. Imagine. <laughs> Oh my God. But anyway, so I always go back to that perception thing that how am I looking at it? What is it that is holding me back from figuring this out? And I have to get over myself because I didn't want to learn yeah. about Braille. I didn't want to learn about yeah. the white team because I'm an idiot, right? I mean, like, come on, those are the tools that are going to give him the two things that blind people need, independence and literacy. And right. once he had those, I mean, so here's a, here's a kicker. One of my biggest dreams for him in my mind before I even met Michael was valedictorian. I just had this vision that I would have a valedictorian. I think because school was a big deal to me and that's like the ultimate mm -hmm. achievement. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. I was like crazy about, and then I was like, well, there goes valedictorian. Do you know that he ended up, he had no idea that was a dream of mine that I let go of. And he ended up the valedictorian. Oh, wow. That's awesome. Standing on the stage. I have this great picture when I give this speech about it. And he's on the stage with thousands of people because his class was 600 kids. Oh, wow. Thousands of people at that graduation. And he's standing there with every possible accolade around his neck. Wow. And he's using his electronic brailler to give his speech. Oh, wow. Isn't that cool? That, that is so cool. Yeah. It's so been cool. a cool journey. Yeah. I can't wait to see what your, now I can't wait to see what your oldest son does, but your second son also was born the same way. He was blind, right? Yeah. Now yeah. is he to the same extent as your oldest or? Yeah, they have different, um, <laughs> you know, they say every kid is different. Yes. <laughs> I swear to God, if I wasn't there when they entered the world, I would think that one of them came from somewhere else because <laughs> They're so different that even my, the retina specialist up in Boston, like when they go to the retina specialist with this, with this blindness, it is a, a literally an all day sun up to sundown event. Oh, wow. They do all these tests and whatever, because there's a lot of research now too. So mm. all day they spend, this team spends with my boys. And then at the end of the day, they were like, Kristen, they are so different. And I'm like, <laughs> I know. And then they go, even their retinas are completely opposite with the same oh. disease. Huh. Yeah. So Michael oh, has like, um, if you picture the bullseye, a target, mm -hmm. and then kind of lay Swiss cheese over that. So it's like rings of vision and no vision, and then Swiss cheese over it with some holes of it. It's just a mess. Mm -hmm. And Mitchell doesn't have any central whatsoever, but he has a little bit of peripheral. Mm -hmm. that, like he can pull his, his iPhone up to the corner of his eye and see some stuff. Oh, wow. But, mm -hmm. but... Michael tried to live in both the blind and sighted world for a long time, which was partly my problem. I didn't uh, bring Braille in until late because I was mm -hmm. a late bloomer with my acceptance. But Mitch was very early on. Um, he started Braille. God, he was like born and I labeled the house in Braille. Oh, and cool. he's always kind of been more in the blind. I say the blind world. 
Yeah. Mitchell's also my, he's a middle child. He does not <laughs> give any extra effort to anything, you know? So he's like, why would I try to work out things as a sighted person? And nope, I'm just blind and that's just, it. Yeah. <laughs> And it's easier. It's easier that he just did that from the beginning. But they yeah. both have their their incredible accomplishments and stuff that I never. They're both baseball championship winners. That's awesome. On little league That's, sighted regular town teams. Right. Right. Now, how did that? How did they do that? Like the well, the long story short is they played outfield with okay. another guy. I wouldn't oh. let them do infield because I was like, I paid way too much money for braces and we're right. not. <laughs> nah. So they played in the outfield with another guy and the other guy would field the ball and give it to, to like, if Michael was out there, give it to Michael. And it was funny because the whole, all the kids learned instantaneously. It was the parents that drove us crazy. Everyone mm. learned to just get completely silent. If Michael or Mitchell had the ball, because wherever the play needed to be made, that was the one person that would call their name and they, oh, wow. they could throw it to that guy on a dime. That's, that's incredible. Yeah. That's pretty and then cool. they had to hit off a tee. So anyone that's listening that has, you know, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old boy or girl mm -hmm. that is over the coach pitch and gets into swinging the bat to have to bring a tee out. That was a hard one for Michael. Mm. But once we got him over that, that was one conversation about, how can you help your team if you're only getting three swings and you're never going to connect? Mm. And then we brought the tea out. Um, the kids were unbelievable. I was worried about kids being, right. you know, jerks. On them. Yeah. No, they were, they were absolutely unbelievable with it. And they, both the boys were, um, they were voted as all stars. They were, Michael led the team in RBIs. Oh, wow. Mitch was such a good base runner that he wanted to steal bases and we had to figure out a system <laughs> real quick. <laughs> Because he would just take off. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it was so, fun. And now you have a daughter too, right? Yeah, my Carissa, is, so she's, oh, I wouldn't recommend this. Mitchell and Carissa are 13 months apart. Not, a, not exactly in the plan either. <laughs> that wasn't on the checklist. <sighs> but um, she is a very unique um, if you watch my TED talk, my, my coach for my TED talk actually helped me get Carissa into the story because Carissa doesn't want to be in the story. She's very shy. Mm. She likes to be in the background and she makes everything happen in this house. She's one of those. And she is the most amazing observer you could ever see. Mm. And um, so she doesn't like to be on the forefront. However, what we realized is Carissa, if people could go about their life like Carissa was born into, that's where um, true acceptance and inclusion. And so she was born into a family that already had things, accessibility and, and all that. Mm. So she never saw struggle with, with blindness. Right. She's only ever seen them as pain in the neck brothers that, you know, <laughs> right. typical sibling stuff. All right. She has seen them do everything that some stuff that she can't do because they're smarter than she is, but she works harder than they do. It's like this trade off. They're, now they're in blind sports and Mitchell's an elite blind sports person in the country, but Carissa is an elite sports person in, in the stuff that she does. So she's never seen that as a barrier. So she mm. goes about her life, not seeing, she doesn't have any of the bias that we have. Right. right. And to, to watch a person go through life with zero bias is uncanny to me. And I got to figure out how to bottle that. <laughs> and teach that to other people. Yeah. Because what yeah. a world that would be, you know? Yeah, that would be awesome. Because everybody would just put away their stuff and accept everybody, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I always say, look, if a person's a jerk, let, they're a jerk. Right. But you don't make this assumption that you're not going to associate because they've got what? They're in a wheelchair. They've got a cane. They look different from you. Their hair is is green. Like, right. You can't judge it on that. Judge it if they're a jerk or not a jerk. You know, they're a true personality, but give them a chance. But yeah. most people see the instantaneous picture. And so it's very interesting with my three kids. There's no bias be initial because my boys can't see the person. So they don't have the visual bias we all have. Carissa mm -hmm. doesn't give a crap what you're rolling up in. If it's a chair, you know, a cast right. on your foot or yellow hair, and she doesn't care. It's when they really start getting to know a person that, and my kids are very open to getting to know people. And, and then that's where they make their 
decisions yeah, if they're going to be someone to hang out with or not. It's pretty cool. Now they don't treat each other that way. They don't give any, they don't not. give each other any of the love <laughs> and kindness. Yeah. No. I oh agree. my God. <laughs> Yeah, that's eye for eye with my kids. It's like, all right, hold on a minute. <laughs> yeah, we're the same way. I have a, um, he's going to be 15, my older son, and uh, my daughter who's 13. So 22 months apart. Yeah. Total opposites, polar opposites. Um, always interesting. Never, yeah. <laughs> never a day. Times. A dull day. <laughs> Um, okay. So tell me a little bit about, um, your Facebook group, Brilliantly Resilient, because I know you talk about your journey and I know you also have other people on your live show. And for anybody that's listening, you can absolutely go over to Facebook and join their free group and you can check it out. And you guys, um, you and Mary Fran, uh, Bon Tempo are doing daily shows still. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Daily live shows. Yep, and... that's fun when your hair salon's been closed for like two months. That's fun to be live every day on video. <laughs> right. um, but if anybody wants to join their Facebook group, I mean, I'm going to have show notes uh, over at shapeitupfitness.com and you can just click directly to their page and you can check it out. So yep. tell me a little bit about how you guys kind of started Brilliantly Resilient and how you trans transpired, I guess, over to Facebook Lives. Yeah. So, so the all very short version is Mary Fran and I just met like two years ago. I mean, oh, really? we haven't even known each other that long and we were in a, a mastermind group that a mutual friend of ours put six of us in to work on, um, you know, just the whole mastermind concept, which is a wonderful concept and have accountability. We were, I have a, a global nonprofit and I needed to take it to the next level. I wanted to write a book and I wanted to get my speaking like really fired up. Mm. So it was this accountability group. If you ever, if you know the the whole theory behind mastermind, and it was wonderful. And then, who only a few, maybe two months in, the woman that got us together and another woman in the group were like, they were way far ahead of the rest of us. So they were mm. like, and we were being silly, like <laughs> so crazy. Because I I can go like, I can work hard for a couple hours, and then I'm like, I blow. It's like, wow, <laughs> I need to do something crazy. So, and it worked, I mean, we're all like still incredibly good friends, um, but it just wasn't working. So then there was four of us and then the four of us became, we turned all of our stuff into a podcast because people were saying, how did you grow your businesses so big, so fast? Then we were on this podcast, but as we were talking in the group of four and then interviewing people, it just kept, Mary Fran and I are so different. It's insane. Right. <laughs> We're not in the same circles. We have, I mean, she's married for 10,000 years, has grandkids, <laughs> right. right? And I'm like this crazy hair falling out, going through divorce and three, two blind cats. Like, it's just crazy. We're to totally different. But when we were in these interviews and hanging out, we just have so many similarities in our journeys and, and how we see life, you know? So then so much of that was coming together. And then, um, then we realized all of the, resilience and and practice in it yeah. that we have had in our lives and we would get into these big conversations about resilience and we have very similar tools of resilience and the biggest connector was faith we didn't realize that the other one faith was a big tool in our toolbox mm -hmm. um and and not like the churchy faith more of like a deep rooted like christianity and and celebration and all that kind of stuff so anyway um so we then said, let's put this event together, this program of Brilliantly Resilient and help people. Because everyone would say to us, God, you guys have the best time. And then when they find out our stories, they're like, how do you get up in the morning? Smile? Right. <laughs> yeah. And they're yeah. like, and these are laughing and silly. And I'm like, oh my God, it is a train wreck every day. But here's the things that we've learned along the way. And when you come out of a pit constantly, you know, we don't sweat a lot of the small stuff that other people sweat, right. you know? So anyway, so then um, we decided to do this Brilliantly Resilient as a live program. And we joked, we were joking that we were going on a world tour. Like we were going to take this sucker <laughs> all around the world. And then we were like, let's reel it in. Because Mary Fran's always like, oh my God, reel it in. You know? So we're like, all right, let's start with our community. So that event that you came to was the kickoff where we brought in a bunch of people from the community to say, like we had... Um, the district attorney was there, school districts were there, the chamber to say, yeah. how can we help your businesses in the community? How can we help the kids, the families? And that was what we were launching here. And then we were going to grow from there. And then the world shut down. Right. 
And then we had intended for the show to be professionally produced. I was, I was converting a part of my house into the studio. Oh, wow. To have this, and my, I, my son is a sound guy and he has professional equipment and we were gonna do a professional show where we were talking about the tools of becoming brilliantly resilient. Mm. Then when everything shut down, we were like, you know what, this is crazy that we're gonna wait. We don't even know when that would be able to come out. Right. Let's just do it now. We turned on our goofy laptops and reached out to friends of ours to say, do you want to come on and talk about, you know, your son, talk about all the stuff you <laughs> failed at and people have failed you and let's do it all over the internet. Right. And live. <laughs> and live. No stress. No. Put no. it all out there. And it's just gone. It's, it, it has been honest to God. It, it, we're supposed to be helping all these other people and this show has helped me every single day in this crisis because we, Mary Fran and I laugh every single day. Like, where would we be? I'd probably still be in Costco's parking lot in my Jeep crying because that was me when this all started. It's like, you know, and I'm sure the people listening can, can um, empathize with pieces of it. Like I'm a single mom with full time, three teenagers with, with um, an ex-husband that is looking for every opportunity to try to, to hammer away at the four of us. Mm. So I'm constantly on guard of like, am I making the right decision? Are they safe? Are they? So when this thing hit, I'm like, how do, how do you keep these three kids safe when no one knows how to, to manage this virus, right. you know? And then I'm like, do I go out and get them food? Like, it was just a mess. So um, I, I learned through every guest, it, it, to still, every single day, I have a takeaway from every guest about what I'm currently involved in and how to reset my mind mm. and continue with the rising. It, it's, it's uncanny that it's every single day. So just the other day, my dad was rushed to the hospital with a stroke. He's okay oh, no. now. But you know, this COVID thing is like the family can't be there with him. My mom's by herself. Right. He's, you know, we're trying to get information and blah, blah, blah. And then I'm like, Mary Fran's like, let's forget the show. Let's just figure stuff out for your dad. And I'm like, I just feel like I need that half an hour yeah. with each of the guests. Cause I'm, I know there's going to be a takeaway from each of them. And, and isn't that the, that's what's happened every single day. There's a takeaway from each person. And then I go back to that crisis with a whole new perspective. Right. Yeah. I think that's where like, we all need each other. We can't be uh -huh. on a little Island by ourselves. And especially now that we are locked down or whatever you want to call it, sheltered home, um, you know, having that we're taking, we took advantage of having that actual interaction with people in the same space. And yep. now because we're all online, it's like, I think people are reaching out to more people in general. Like I know I've reached out to some friends that I haven't talked to in a while. And I think even though like the whole situation is probably not the most ideal situation we are in, <laughs> but I think everything, there's always a, a silver lining. There's always something good that's going to come out of whatever situation that you're in. Oh, I believe it too. And yeah. honestly, I will say one of the, and I'll tie this all together. One of the, the biggest blessing that came out of blindness for me, and I do not consider blindness a blessing or a not blessing. It just is right. Right. I think the biggest blessing that came out was, my dreams for my kids were crushed and eliminated. And I wish that for every parent, I wish they would take their dreams and eliminate them and let see what surfaces with the kid with their dreams. Yeah. Cause it's not about us. Right. Right. But that took me a long time to realize that because I was doing it to my sighted daughter and I was double impacting her mm. that she was going to be, you know, I saw her athletic talent and the boys, their, their athletic dreams, a lot of them had to go away. And I'm thinking, oh, here's my athlete here. And I'm like, what is the matter with me? <laughs> so I had to take that off of her. Once I took that off of her and watched her soar and realized that that was the beauty in my dreams being extinguished for the boys. And I wish that parents would do that, which is actually happening now. All dreams are crushed, right? Well, for the most part, right. dreams are crushed right now. Yeah. And, and it's almost like a lot of these kids have this new chance. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Like for the, for the seniors, are they going to be okay? They're fresh. Are they even going away to college in the fall? All, all of those yeah, things. And now it's like you're at ground zero and you can start wherever you can go wherever you want. Now you can figure it out on your, the way you want to figure it out. Yeah. I, you know? I think you um, got the good end of the stick for, having your dreams crushed as far as your, your kids, especially your boys, because 
I think there are a lot of adults that when they have kids, they're like, like for me, I always got the question because I was a professional ballet dancer. They're like, oh, is your daughter going to dance? And I was like, she can do whatever she wants. <laughs> I don't yeah. care. Um, but I think, yeah, having that, I think when as a parent, taking the expectations off your children and instead of focusing on them, you should be focusing on you and what you want to do with your life rather than, do you know what I'm yeah. saying? Like you guide yeah. your kids, but like you're saying, just let them kind of navigate and let them figure out their way. Yeah. Yeah. And that, I mean, in, in the blind world, it's called sighted guide where you walk with the blind person, they take your elbow or they can take your wrist mm -hmm. and you literally are just their eyes in case it's a, it's a complicated situation for the most part. I mean, my son, Michael has been, he's traveled to Europe. I mean, he's gone everywhere independently oh, wow. and he figures it all out, but there are times and he, my boys love doing sighted guide, especially, I mean, for me, think about it. I've been doing this their whole lives. So in those years where the kids don't want you anywhere near them, we were like literally stuck together, but we had mm. a relationship to that point of they enjoy it and they, and we can rely on each other. And, and I, of course, I'm always like, when they do stuff, I'm like, you guys are amazing. Like they, it's not that they're amazing as they get out of bed in the day and they walk down the street and they're blind and oh my God, that's great. It's watching them go after what they want, figure out the obstacles, find teams of people to help them. I mean, their skills are like, it's crazy because half or 70% of the blind community is unemployed. And I'm like, I'm actually working on a Ted talk with another person to say, my thing is, whoa, the world has it wrong. You should be, the blind people should have the advantage in hiring because since they were kids, they've learned how to communicate, how to organize a team, how to figure things out. I mean, their problem solving skills are astronomical, yeah. um, but they are up against stuff like that. So, but, but in terms of sighted guide, that's what we should just be a guide for our kids. It's yeah. hard. I mean, it's really hard when you watch them doing some stuff, you're like, whoa, you're <laughs> I dating her still? Whoa. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's normal whether your child yeah. is blind or not. Yeah. Um, I don't think you give yourself enough credit though, because the, just in what you were just saying about how they're, um, you know, reaching out to people and how they're kind of overcoming whatever obstacles they have, I'm sure they learned that from you because that is exactly what you did after day, after year three, it sounds like, you know, you went out and you got information and you, you know, were very resourceful. So I'm sure they picked yeah. up on that. <laughs> Yeah. Well, they didn't um, know the early years. Thank God. Like, yeah. They would have been like, they did actually, they do know a bit of the early story because of my Ted talk. And I had to give, I had to present it to them first because they were going with me to New York to be on oh. this big stage. And I'm like, you guys, there's a yeah. part of the story. I never By the way, <laughs> they thought it was hilarious. Oh, good. <laughs> my kids are demented. They're like, you cried for how long? Cause they don't see it as they think sighted people are nuts that they think blindness is a big deal. <laughs> That's great. Um, one of the second things that I loved about, um, watching you guys in Brilliantly Resilient is, and I can't remember the exact context, I know you can fill it in, but there was a man, I think, um, uh, he was high up and you were trying to start your nonprofit and he basically shut you down. Is that the, yeah, yeah. I, when you were telling that part of the story and you can fill in the blanks, but, um, the fact that he came back to you and was just like, you know, squashed you basically. And you were like, Oh no, <laughs> you just didn't do that. <laughs> and you came back even more, you know, and proved to him. So if you want to kind of condense that story and share that with everybody, yeah, you, you can tell it better than I can. Because initially I was like crying on the couch again, because here I am starting this. It's, it's a long story, but by Oh nine, Michael was born in 2000 diagnosed in 2000. By 09, I got wind of the clinical trial had just gotten underway to reverse blindness. And also at the same, in the same month, found out the genetic cause for Michael's blindness. And it's very similar to the one they were working on here in Philly at CHOP. And it made worldwide news. Oh, wow. So of course I said, how can we be next? And then um, I talked to our specialist who was involved in that project. And he said, well, the way you begin, again, Chris, Delirious optimist does not hear, <laughs> hear step one of 957 things. <laughs> and now my friends in the rare disease world do, do say that, thank God, there's a lot of us that don't hear that there's going to be 957 steps. Because if I would have known what I would have had to do, I never would have said yes yeah. all those years ago, nine years ago. So anyway, he says, here's step one, you know, 
raise $100,000 a year for three years. That's how science research begins. I didn't hear begins. I just said, let's do it. (laughs) Right. So I sent this letter out through my network and it went all the way through like the Phillies organization, all these high up people. And it hits this guy that makes a ridiculous amount of money in the research world. And he sends it all the way back saying this, oh, that cute little mom thinks she's going to make a dent. She has no idea. Well, no, I didn't have any idea, thank God. But when that <laughs> came back, I was mortified, you know? And if you watch all the stuff that Brene Brown does on shame, mm-hmm. you know, and talk about shame, I was completely mortified. Because at that point in my life, I'm like, I got this. I, I can handle this. I'm going to run this. And, and then he says, you're an idiot. And plus, it was also a really bad time in my personal life anyway. So I was just crushed. Mm. And then, what was it? Six years later. So I, st- I got back up, you know, contacted these moms, got going and whatever, and the organization was growing, growing. And then six years later, almost to the day, I get a phone call. 12 people in the world were invited to the FDA to testify on behalf of that little gene therapy to be FDA approved to, to reverse blindness. And that guy and me were two of the 12. Yeah. Yeah. And then that's at the FDA hearing is when he came, when it was unanimous, um, unanimously approved. And it was the fastest decision that had ever come through at a meeting like that. And yeah. I was because I was of you, proud. right? Because of all you're reaching out. Well, I mean, I was one of 12 people. So it was, it was 12 people that testified and it was just so the thing that the, here's an, an interesting thing about when you're trying to stick with a mission and get people on board, the science for that, Uh, treatment because it's not a cure the science for it i knew was terrible in terms of being convincing it was only a fraction of a percentage in terms of science but how it translates in real life i had met two of the kids that had the gene therapy and i saw the difference in them i met Mm -hmm. one before he had it and, and two weeks later when it started working so i already had the proof that it worked i didn't need to be convinced but other people did right um and I changed my testimony. I, they didn't need, they had patients that had vision restored. They didn't need me to cheer that on. They needed, I needed to be the voice of, do you know how, do you know how much it costs to raise a blind child? Like, do you know mm. the cost to society that we haven't figured out how to make it a better term, financial situation? Yeah. So anyway, but after it was all said and done, and then he came up to me and, and he was like, um, Kristen, you've done really good work. And I wanted to go, look, yeah, I was going to go like <laughs> Billy town on yeah. him. Right. And all I did was, and I was, then I was like, just be a professional. Like this don't prove his point that I don't have the professionalism. Right. So I just looked at him and he's real tall. I looked up at him and I go, I know. right? I started doing like this goofy dance. And then he just shook his head laughing. And he was like, yeah, you do a good job. And then he, I think he ran in the opposite direction. But it was a good <laughs> It was a good, I, you know, thank God I never quit because the lives we've impacted and, and our, um, it wasn't news there yet at the, uh, event we found out in the middle of this most horrific time in this world, I got the phone call that our clinical trial is opening in two mm-hmm. years. It's ready to go. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so That's we'll awesome. Have a gene therapy. Um, we'll have at least one treatment option for this disease. Oh, wow. Yeah. Crazy, right? That was crazy. It's amazing how long it takes to do. Oh, do you know what I mean? Could, like, uh, it's crazy. I don't even get me started on science. I'm like, yeah. really? <laughs> That's why I never liked it in high That's school. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So because of time, I just wanted to let everybody know that you do have a book. You are an author and the title of the book is thriving blind stories, real people succeeding without sight. And it was a number one new release on Amazon and number two on the bestseller list. So you can access that, I'm assuming, on Amazon. And you can also get that at your website. Is that correct? Yeah, the um, electronic Braille. We actually have it in electronic Braille, oh, cool. which was one of the reasons that I self-published. Um, that's available at kristensmedley.com. Okay, awesome. And again, everybody, the show notes will be um, filled with all of Kristen's stuff. And also, um, I did listen to your TED Talk, and I thought it was great. It brought me right back to the Brilliantly Resilient live show. And I just really love how you um, sprinkle in like witty sarcasm, because that is like up my alley. (laughs) (laughs) That's why Mary Fred and I get along. It's like, yeah, it is interesting, because you guys are very different. Um, even like physically, I mean, you're like, you know, you have dark, long hair and she's got really short blonde hair and, (laughs) 
<laughs> just, she's like munchkin tiny. You know, I'm, well, I'm tiny too. No, you're I'm the only too. one. She's the only one that I feel Amazon tall around because I'm not tall. <laughs> you're and not. Everybody's tall compared to Mary Fran. So I, I'm in the same group. I'm only <laughs> five two on a good day. So <laughs> all right. So let's dive into the speed round real quick. Okay. All right. So if anybody has not been following the podcast, the speed round basically is I'm just going to fire some questions at Kristen and see what her answers are. <laughs> All right. So number one, what is your favorite song that you don't want anyone to know that you really rock out to? Oh, see, everyone knows I rock out to absolutely everything. Um, I, okay. So this drives my kids crazy. My running playlist, and I mean the running playlist that I belt out the songs <laughs> in the local park on the hills is i call it jesus jams it's all of the christian rock from k-love radio okay and i seriously i'm like i'm a believer people in the park are like <laughs> here comes <"Wow."> Kristen." <laughs> yeah but i'm always like look yes. you need jesus to get up some of those hills so <laughs> that's it's awesome. my jesus jams that's awesome. <laughs> all right so what is your favorite book and why uh, my favorite book is Touch the Top of the World by Eric Weimeyer. Hmm. He's the first blind man to summit Everest, and he has gone on to climb all seven summits oh, and wow. do a hell of a lot more crazy crap that I don't even want my boys to know about half the time. <laughs> but it's not even his story of blindness. It is his story of resilience and wit and realness and he's one of the coolest people you could ever meet but touch the top of the world is one of the hardest stories you'll ever read for the first half hmm. but you have to go through the first half which is what i told my mom when she screamed at me for sending it to her <laughs> you have to go through the first half with him to appreciate and cheer for the second half and all of our lives can fit right in the same thing as touch the top of the world it's the hero's journey but it's the real like real life grit hero's mm. journey it's I'll a good to story. check that out yeah okay so coffee or tea or maybe should i throw in wine <laughs> um <laughs> coffee all day and then i say that because i'm such a good christian by five o'clock i turn the water into wine <laughs> <laughs> it's been blessed <laughs> Yep, I live a blessed life. At five o'clock, we do a switch over. <laughs> uh, okay, what is your favorite movie? Uh, best movie of all time is Steel Magnolias. Okay. And your favorite inspirational quote? Um, well, there's a zillion of them, but I would probably say the Ralph Waldo Emerson one where, and I know I'm going to get it wrong, but it goes to the effect of our chief want in life is someone who will inspire us to be what we knew we could be. Mm, that's good. Yeah, I like that one. Yeah. All right. Well, we are all done. <laughs> so, <laughs> the wild you. ride is over. <laughs> it's come to a stop. No, we off the no, no, no. Medley train. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is awesome. And I know your story is going to resonate with people, whether they have a blind child or whether they are going through something else in their life or whether it's just the coronavirus, who knows, but I know that it's going to resonate with other people. Um, do check out Brilliantly Resilient over on Facebook. Again, you can go to shapeitupfitness.com and get all the links and your website, Kristen is kristensmedley.com. Okay. And again, that will also be on the show notes as well. So are there any parting words that you want to share with everyone before we wrap everything up? I think the most important thing to remember is, like you said, if whether you have a blind child or not, you know, my story, yes, blindness was a big thing, but you can insert anything into that whole, you know, I was, I was fearful. I was, I was resisting. Um, I thought that this was something against me. You know, all those things we go through, I did it again in my divorce. I did it when my, I was facing bankruptcy. We all have those moments and there's no shame in that. It's human right? The shame would be if you don't raise your hand and ask for help and, and get someone to help you climb out of that pit and learn from it, move on. But then, as my son always says, life isn't a one-way street. Turn around and look and see who else can you be on their team and help them rise up to. Yeah, that's great. I think too, um, like you were talking about resistance, I, and it goes back to what you were saying, in every time that you kind of let go and we're like, all right, I'm giving it to you, you know, <laughs> you take care of it. I think that's when the magic happens, if you want to call it magic. And yeah. just kind of letting it go 
And yep. I don't think a lot of us let things go. <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately. That's the dream. Yeah. Let it go. <laughs> All right, Kristen. Well, thank you so much for being on and everybody else have a wonderful day and I will talk to you next week. Thanks. Hey everybody, if you enjoyed this Shape It Up podcast episode, I want to invite you to head over to iTunes and on the Apple podcast, just click on the Shape It Up Over 40 podcast, scroll all the way down to the bottom, and please leave a review. I can't wait to read what you write. And I will be taking some reviews and possibly reading them on the podcast, so your review might get read. Once you're done your review, head over to shapeitupfitness.com and find out how I can help you lose weight for the last time.